Welcome to the Secure CIO, the podcast for technology executives who are tasked with hiring and retaining great cybersecurity leaders. Join best selling author Claire Pales together with industry thought leaders as they answer your questions about sourcing the right leaders, building cybersecurity teams, candidate selection, salaries, skills, and more. Hello, I'm Claire Pales, and welcome to Secure CIO Podcast. Today's guest is Justin Davies. Justin is the CIO of Avato. Justin is well aware that the halcyon days of traditional media and marketing might be over, but the demands of increasingly risk-aware customers and executives in the electronic communication age means there is increasing scrutiny and compliance obligations on how information is protected, stored, and used by the organisation. Resourceful, practical, and energetic, Justin is facing the all-too-common dilemma of doing more with less. His primary approach is to uncomplicate IT by challenging structure, removing boundaries, increasing accountability within teams and individuals, and encouraging a proactive and empowered workforce capable of responsible decision-making. Multifaceted, his personal strengths include buying more value for less, relationships and expectation management, building a strategic and company-aligned vision, and creating a transformational agenda for quality IT professionals to do what they do best. Justin, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's my pleasure, Claire, and thank you for inviting me. So for a bit of context, tell us a little bit about Avato. What's the size of the organisation and maybe the makeup of the tech team? Yeah, so we're 1,700 staff. 1,200 of those are your typical end user, computer users. And then we've probably, you know, given that we are a traditional marketing services uh, business, including print and distribution, uh, as well as our creative and digital marketing services, about 500 of our staff in manufacturing or manual. So uh, they're generally not your computer users, although they could probably be described as uh, Internet of Things users or RF users. So I suppose they offer me far less vulnerability uh, when it comes to security management, given you know, typically you know, what IoT do, is doing is watching, counting, recording and reporting it, uh, not really letting users make mistakes. In terms of the IT footprint, uh, I have 36 IT staff in my team. This is just a recently consolidated uh, IT team, which I'll talk about a little bit later, no doubt. Uh, but I also look after um, a product solutions group, which is uh, because we are a digital marketing organisation and a creative services organisation. Uh, we have digital marketing products that we sell direct to market. And we've got 38 staff involved in development, delivery um, and support of those systems as well. So... Obviously, security sits under your remit as well. What's been your experience across your career as the head of a tech department or CIO in relation to cybersecurity? And is your role at Avato your first foray into having these types of staff report to you? No, so I've been in management for quite a while, in IT management that is, and um, in product management. So security has always been on the agenda. The last three years has probably seen an increased focus. We merged recently with another large organisation. We were called PMP, PMP Limited, a publicly listed company, and we merged with a private company by the name of IPMG. So through that merger, uh, we obviously were put in a position where um, two large companies, two large networks uh, needed to be joined. I'm talking about physical networks. Um, you know, WANs, uh, all of the uh, internet services, uh, and basically what we did for a period of time until we got an opportunity to redesign things uh, was we had, which was you know, more akin to two cups with a piece of string holding two networks together. So I was fortunate enough to be able to attract some funding to completely redesign our network, which we've been able, uh, we've just completed doing actually about two months ago. It included not only the network, but it was a redesign of our data centers, um, and all of our internet connectivity. The important thing there, obviously, is as CIO, when you've got such um, a disparate network like that, you know, we had nine internet gateways uh, that we were supporting in the organisation. Some of those in uh, in business units with their own IT personnel that I really had no visibility control over as well. So uh, I suppose the, the network redesign was really driven by 
uh, not only performance requirements, but actually a security agenda to make sure that uh, we turn two companies into one company. So I suppose there was a few items that really drove security. The network redesign, consolidating IT um, across the whole group, making sure that we're one department, which we're uh, just about completed as well. Um, and obviously, uh, there's been a lot of focus the last few years with you know, data privacy requirements driven by GDPR and uh, and also data breach legislation introduced into Australia as well. So all of these things have become a huge focus. Um, and in my role, I can't ignore that. Um, and that's, I suppose, where um, I've seen an increased emphasis uh, more than anything uh, in security. Uh, it was always there, but uh, certainly emphasis has increased. So how long ago did this process start in terms of that triggering for the network, bring the network together and the cybersecurity piece? And how long has it taken you, I guess, to get to a point where cybersecurity, the sentiment and the vibe in your organisation is is sort of greater and, and more focused? Uh, the merger went through uh, probably three years ago now. Um, we had a period of evaluation uh, probably for four to six months. We had some other priorities in terms of merging a couple of MIS systems, which uh, were really you know, running the bulk of our print businesses. Um, so that was probably priority one. And priority two then became uh, really looking at infrastructure um, and trying to get the company <laughs> from an infrastructure perspective looking like a single company. So it took six months to uh, attract the funding for the network redesign and it took 18 months to actually execute the uh, the network redesign. And we did that largely, um, in fact, we did it probably 95% with internal resources, which is something that I'm quite proud of. I did bring in a, a network architect, an independent um, from a company named Inteo, um, who provided some really good support to us. But, you know, in terms of the data centre redesign, the network redesign and the execution of all of that, including our gateways, um, yeah, it was largely handled internally. So yeah, it was, a, it was a, major, a major feat for us. It was a, a million-dollar-plus project, even though we resourced it ourselves. So you know, a lot of investment in equipment as well. So given that you just mentioned that you did most of the, the work for the network, bringing the network together and, and merging the two systems, given that you did most of that internally, how did you bring the security team together and, and, and how did you get staff to focus on that area for you? Uh, so if we look at the project itself, after uh, merging with IPMG, we brought two IT teams together basically. So we had a, a fairly sizable team and we had uh, a number of quality uh, sysadmins and network administrators uh, at our disposal and quality resources at that. So I think there's a there's a natural skill set and interest that comes with system administrators and, and network professionals uh, for security. Uh, so really, uh, I think uh, you know, they're able to handle a lot of the, the requirements around delivery of the network. Um, I suppose what we did uh, was develop a security program and a security agenda uh, to support the network redesign that was probably uh, an extension to to what we were doing for the network. It was more just becoming a little bit more structured, um, a little bit more disciplined around the way we manage security across the organisation, you know, including things like patch management you know, for end users and servers and doing things like uh, uh, introducing... Um, phishing simulations and those sorts of things so that we can start to educate uh, our user base. Um, I do see that as you know, one of our biggest vulnerabilities as a company is although we can block things at the perimeter, there is plenty that can still get in that looks legitimate. There's no reason for technology to stop it. And yeah, in terms of uh, what keeps me up at night, I think you know, it's, you know, it's what can get into the organisation that... Uh, that looks legit that uh, our end users might fall for. Yeah, I mean, the challenge is um, just sort of keeping the organisation abreast of what's going on and, and, and from a security perspective, keeping them aware. And, I mean, your decision to hire internally, did you feel like that was the, the greatest option for you to go with people who knew the networks as opposed to going out to market to bring in people who were, I guess, more skilled in the cybersecurity area but weren't across your your sort of industry vertical or your particular systems? No, so I, I saw it more as uh, 
a, a factor of the merger that the, we, we weren't really in an, an opportunity. We didn't have the opportunity to go and introduce more staff into the organisation. You know, we had an agenda for rationalising. Um, you know, when you bring two companies together, um, you know, there are synergies that need to be achieved um, and you promise the shareholders those synergies um, and it's hard enough to go and get those without, uh, you know, adding you know, senior people um, into your structure on top of that. So it was a little bit of, uh, you know, working with what you have, but uh, again, at the same time, just because you don't have a budget to go and get those resources, it's no excuse. You can't just put your head in the sand and say, uh, look, I've got an excuse and, you know, I can drop security uh, from being front of mind. You know, you just need to find a way. And so in terms of you looking at the staff that were available to you, were there particular traits or skills that you looked at your staff and thought they've got these particular skills that I'm after and so I'm going to choose that person? Was it? Did you see a need for a particular security skill set? No. So what I did observe amongst the team is uh, uh, obviously the team's made up of a number of individuals and they all have different security radars and you only have to be involved and listening to the team in their day-to-day activity uh, to know who's heightened regarding security and you know who sees security I suppose as as being more of an inconvenience um, and that's all healthy conflict and uh, and that it really helps you uh, understand uh, and create a balance uh, when it comes to providing um, a secure environment that does have, you know, a, a mix of practicality about it as well. Because at the end of the day, uh, we're not a security company. Um, we're a marketing services business and we're here to, you know, to obviously deliver marketing services to our customers, but we have to do it in a secure manner. So uh, secure ca- uh, security can't consume us, but we have to be mindful and we have to make sure that we're not, uh, you know, jeopardising what we actually do as a business by making sure that we've got appropriate levels of security in place. I think that's a really key point and something that my listeners will really resonate with that, you know, at the end of the day, you're providing a service to your customers and you can't let security become a roadblock for that. Um, But at the same time, there's an expectation, sometimes one that's unspoken, that, that you'll protect the data and the information and the IP of the company. Have you come up against many sort of hurdles or roadblocks in your efforts to build a security function and and a secure way of doing business? More and more over the last couple of years, um, what we're seeing is that our customers are more security aware. Uh, So when we're receiving customer contracts, uh, they're looking for greater levels of compliance. It's now written into the terms and conditions of most customer contracts that come across the desk. Whereas if I look back four years ago, that was far less common. I actually think a lot of this has been driven by things like uh, GDPR. Obviously, you know there have been some um, some fairly major cyber attacks as well that uh, has put it you know on the forefront. And we would think about examples like uh, at Mondelez here in Australia, which uh, is rumoured to have cost them a hundred million dollars. Well, mm. that certainly puts it on the agenda for the customer as well is who are they dealing with from a supply perspective and who are they supplying their data to and is their data protected? So there's a lot of organisations that you mentioned GDPR and there are regulators now that are, are really imposing cybersecurity implementation projects and programs and controls because because of the events that are happening globally. And for you, do you think, given the journey that you've just been on, do you think that there's a piece of advice or some sort of words of wisdom that you might give to CIOs that are listening to help them if they are planning to lead a security team or they have to lead one, um, they've inherited one, what would sort of be the key thing you would want to say to them um, before they dive in? Uh, so I, I would be uh, you know, getting you to think about what's important uh, to your business. So always bring your business perspective with it. But I think the primary piece of advice is just get started. Um, and if you already started, just continue on. It's not something that uh, you know is a three-month program and then you can tick it off uh, like you can a lot of IT projects and you can say we can put that behind us. It continues month after month and it won't actually stop. So you just need to create that security agenda in the workplace. Um, now, if that requires a little bit of structure via a program, then which is what we've done, um, at Avato, but you know, I think uh, you 
you know, you just need to make sure that this is a rolling program, um, not a one-off project, and just continue to strive to improve your capability uh, month on month, year on year by introducing new elements to your security program. I think that is fantastic advice and I couldn't have said it better myself. I, I honestly am totally aligned with the idea that, that security is a way of doing business. It, it's not a project um, with a beginning and an end. So um, I think that's great advice. And just one more thing, Justin, if people want to connect with you or um, or chat to you more about the process that you've been through in terms of security or, or the technology journey, uh, where can people find you? Yeah, so I'm uh, available on LinkedIn. Um, if you search my name and uh, obviously my company, you'll pick me up there. Great. Thanks so much for joining us today, Justin. Uh, I really appreciate your time and your willingness to speak about the cybersecurity process that Avato has been through. So thanks for your time. My pleasure, Claire. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. Thanks so much for listening. For more information on all our guests, check out the show notes at thesecurecio.com where you can also find more information on the Secure CIO framework and sign up for my newsletter. If you loved the show, please subscribe to the podcast and feel free to leave me a five-star rating. I'll see you next week.